welcome to Censored, a podcast where I read the bad books so you don't have to. And by bad, I mean both rude and terrible. The blacklist of censored books compiled by the Irish Censor was so extensive that it was sarcastically known as the Everyman's Guide to the Classics, but not all the 12,000 books are considered brilliant literature. There were plenty of turkeys, because bad books can be just as smutty as great ones. I'm Aoife Vrtnach, historian and book addict. This episode, I get to wear my historian hat, because the banned book under consideration, Forever Amber, was set in Restoration England. But I'm a historian of the 19th and 20th centuries rather than the 17th, so I've persuaded Dr. Coleman Dennehy to explain just how rude Restoration England could be. Dr. Dennehy is a legal and criminal historian of the 17th century, with an interest in the regulation of contemporary sex work. He's dead lucky. Historians of this time period get to read about the role of farts in society and call it work. I've got a case of severe 20th century historian envy. The drink for this episode is a glass of Rhenish, German white wine. Interestingly, in this book, men and women do not drink the same thing. Amber's men, and there are lots of them, drink brandy while she sips a white wine, so you have a choice of themed booze. This is the first book where alcohol consumption is so clearly gendered, but this is also the first book of historical fiction. Kathleen Windsor did a lot of research for this book, spending five years working on it. And she didn't leave out any of her research either. It's full of period detail. Arguably too full because it's epically long. I don't know if gendered booze was a historical fact, but it seems like the sort of precise detail Windsor couldn't resist. She adds layer upon layer of sensuous detail in her description of food, for example. Bacon floating in soup, tiny meatballs, flaky pastry. She goes all out on the details. Any book published in 1944 with food porn must have appealed to British readers in particular because they had endured years of rationing and inadequate food. Food and drink play an important role in Windsor's recreation of a gloriously decadent historic past. Hopefully, with this attachment to historical accuracy, there should also be lots and lots of sex. So drink your wine or brandy and get ready for romping in Restoration England. (music) Kathleen Windsor's Forever Amber was published in 1944 and banned in Ireland the following year. It was also banned in Australia, New Zealand and Massachusetts. It's not famous for being banned in Ireland, even though it launched an entire genre of popular literature, the bonk buster. Jackie Collins took up Windsor's mantle in the 1970s and 80s, and Jilly Cooper wrote this book into the 90s. Bonk busters are long, long books that can double as doorstoppers. The story is lush and lavish and lascivious. These books are hugely popular escapist indulgence. When Forever Amber was published in America, it was a stunning success, selling 100,000 copies in the first week. This is a phenomenal achievement. Most books sell just a few thousand copies in a year. It was the biggest selling book of the 1940s, and in 1947 was made into a film with some remarkable costumes that starred Linda Darnell and Cornell Wilde. The story of a beautiful young woman who shamelessly shagged, married, then discarded men, was extremely popular among women readers. This success attracted the attention of censors, who frequently worried about impressionable women readers. Dirty books might give women notions, and those notions could then lead to the disintegration of social order. I'm not being melodramatic, this was a central argument for the censorship of popular literature. The Attorney General in Massachusetts argued that Windsor's book needed to be banned because it was properly indecent. He told a judge that there were 70 references to sexual intercourse, 39 illegitimate pregnancies, 7 abortions, 10 descriptions of women undressing in front of men, and 49 miscellaneous objectionable passages. The book was even burnt on the streets of Boston, apparently. Obviously, I was thrilled to read this book. I devoured Jilly Cooper's books as a teenager, and I love a good bonkbuster. I began my 972-page journey into Restoration England with high hopes. The book begins with Amber's birth, 
then a flashback to the circumstances in which her mother became pregnant. But I actually missed this first sexual encounter completely. It was pages later before I worked out that sex had happened. Judith and John, Amber's parents, are torn apart by war and politics, and I'm going to read you their encounter from page 9. Don't cry, Judith, darling. I'll come back to you. Some day we'll have our own home and our family. Some day we'll have each other. Some day, John. Her arms caught at him desperately. Her face was frightened and her eyes reckless. Some day, but what if some day never comes? An hour later he was gone and Judith rode back to the house, happy and at peace, content as never before in her life. For now, no matter what happened, no matter who won or lost the war, they were sure of each other. You can see why I missed it. An hour later is the only hint that we have that something happened. Everything happens in between the lines. Now, implied smut can be very hot, but there is not even a hint that physical attraction is present. Funnily enough, this sort of implied sex worked quite well in the cinema of the 1930s and 40s, where main characters would give each other smouldering looks and the next shot would feature them in their dressing gowns. I'm not sure it works well on paper where there are no visual clues for the reader to work from. The most important sex scene for character development takes place very early on in the book, between Amber and the cavalier, Lord Bruce Carlton. She's a 16-year-old country girl, he's a much older man, a well-travelled, battle-hardened noble, who had fought to secure Charles II's return to the throne. This sex scene is from page 45, when Amber and Carlton are together in the woods. It's a very picturesque, romantic fantasy scene. At last, his arm reached out, went around her waist and drew her slowly toward him. Amber, tipping her head to meet his mouth, slid both her arms around him. The restraint he had shown thus far now vanished swiftly, giving way to a passion that was savage, violent, ruthlessly selfish. Amber, inexperienced but not innocent, returned his kisses eagerly. Spurred by the caressing of his mouth and hands, her desire mounted apace with his, and though at first she had heard, somewhere far back in her mind, Sarah calling out to her, warning her, the sound in the image grew fainter, dissolved, and was gone. But when he forced her back onto the earth, she gave a quick movement of protest and a little cry. This was as far as her knowledge went. Something mysterious, almost terrible, must lie beyond. Her hands pushed at his chest and she gave a frightened little sob, twisting her face away from his. Her fear now was irrational, intense, almost hysterical. No, she cried, let me go. She saw his face above her and his eyes had become pure glittering green. Amber, crying, half mad with passion and terror, suddenly let herself relax. With slow reluctance, Amber became again conscious of the surrounding world and of both of them as separate individuals. She drew a deep, luxurious sigh, her eyes still closed. She felt that she could not have moved so much as a finger. To explain, Sarah is her foster mother, a symbol of moral probity and wifely success. But here Amber is so flooded with desire that she forgets all she has learnt, all her social obligations, and succumbs to physical desire. It's a pretty melodramatic sex scene, with Carlton playing the dominant, unrelenting male who overpowers an initially reluctant Amber. Once again, this reads like a film scene. It was a common trope in cinema that a woman would struggle, then relax into a kiss. It seems like a deeply unhealthy way to begin a physical relationship, but it was a common trope at the time. Miraculously, given the absence of consent in the uncomfortable forest setting, this was a deeply satisfying sexual experience for Amber. And the next piece is from page 46, The Aftermath. She was warm and drowsy, marvellously content, and glad with every fibre of her being that it had happened. It seemed that until this moment, she had been only half alive. I'm torn between eye-rolling, swearing and retching at this bit. In this horribly regressive passage, sex makes Amber a full person. Take note, ladies, you're only half alive, until you've been transformed by the power of the magic dick. But this is all implied. The language is coded. It's not about the body, but about her interior experience. It's all very muzzy around the edges. The author herself knew that her book did not contain smut, saying, 
I wrote only two sexy passages and my publishers took both of them out. They put ellipses instead. In those days, you could solve everything with an ellipse. Even though Windsor's book had been censored before it was published, it was still considered too risque by Irish, Australian, New Zealand and some American censors. I think the attitude of Amber to sex was the reason to ban it. She has no regrets or guilt about her sexual escapades. She has sex both for love and for mercenary reasons, but doesn't distinguish between the two. Of course, censors did not draw a distinction between suggested or explicit smut because it was all equally dangerous in their twisted minds. They seemed to forget that not all readers would know to look for abortions or sex between the lines. For the censors, the real danger was a heroine who enjoyed herself wholeheartedly, without any apologies. I'm not saying that Amber was so randy she'd get up in a stiff wind. Carnal desire is not a central part of her character. But as a literary character, she has no hang-ups about sex whatsoever. She does it when she wants and with whom she wants. That's all laudable, but I'm here for the rude bits and the coded, suggestive smut is so oblique that even a dirty-minded reader like me struggled to find it. This is exceptionally disappointing, because Restoration England is seen as a time of uninhibited, gratuitous sexual licence, personified by the monarch Charles II. But I wanted to know if the opinions of professional historians and popular culture coincided, so I asked Dr Coleman Dennehy about it. Was Restoration England as rude as we think? Certainly, once we get into the 1660s, people really let loose. There's absolutely no doubt about this. And because there's such a lead from the top, from the royal court, from the the courtiers who inhabit it, from Charles II himself and most of his mistresses, everybody knows, I think in London at least, that, that you can get away with things that you hadn't done before. I might, just by way of example, give you a little quote from an episode in the 1660s at a place called Oxford Kate's Tavern, which is one of the flesh pots around Covent Garden. A number of courtiers are out for a night on the town, and Samuel Pepys records in his diary the following. Sedley, who is one of, of the king's courtiers, showed his nakedness, acting all the postures of lust and buggery that could be imagined, and abusing of scripture. This is on the balcony outside the, the upstairs of the, of the tavern. Preaching a Mount Bank sermon from the pulpit. That being done, he took a glass of wine and he washed his prick in it and then he drank it off and then took another and drank the king's health. And then finally, according to Anthony Wood, all three men turned their backs on the citizenry, putting down their breeches. They excrematized in the street. This is a, a very good story about how things can go on a night out in the 1660s in London. This is this is actually a critical episode, Eva, in many respects. This isn't just about three lads out in the town causing trouble and, and, and you know, pulling their pants down and doing all sorts of things. This is blasphemy in the extreme, you know. We're entering a new age of, of, of scepticism of all sorts. And so what they're actually doing is, you know, this, if, if you're familiar with the Catholic Mass, where the, the priest blesses the sacraments and drinks the wine. It's that sort of an episode that they're trying to recreate, but in the most offensive way possible. Sadly, there are no profane masses or public defecation in Forever Amber. This book is about how Amber, an illegitimate orphan, claws her way out of the gutter by exploiting her beauty and sexual charisma. She manipulates a procession of men for their money and social contacts, ending up an actress in the theatre where she catches the attention of the nobility out in the town. I have a feeling Amber is loosely based on the life of Nell Gwynne, an actress who became a mistress of Charles II, and the parallels between the literary character and the historical character are striking. Gwynne is a fascinating character. In some ways, she she has some aspects that are, are typical of Charles II's mistresses. Many of his mistresses come from not necessarily humble beginnings. Nels is probably the kind of the lowest in terms of a place within society. But a lot of them are sort of down on their luck figures. You know, most of them don't come from the very top levels. And um, maybe maybe Charles has a sort of a fetish of some sort in that regard. Nell comes from. I mean, she her father is not around. We don't know fully what becomes of him. There's so many rumors about her early life, and it's very hard to know which is trustworthy and which is not. She's she 
works in the theatre initially selling oranges um, and she gets into acting. She's a very fine actress in her day. Even before she starts her, her relationship with the king, she's very well regarded as an actress. She's very popular. Uh, she, she's very popular with society. Peeps refers to her a number of times in his diaries. And um, she's regarded to be very good. So she's not just relying on the fact that she's sleeping with the king for her acting success. And like other actresses, um, when they start affairs with senior aristocrats or the king, they tend to not act that much. Nell does go back to the stage for a time when she is with the king, which is very interesting. And obviously roles get made around her. Female actresses are a rel- relatively new thing in the restoration period in 1660 is the first time that they're being done. The king himself is one who promotes the cause of female actresses. So Amber represents a woman on the make whose circumstances are peculiar to Restoration England. Amber finally catches the king's attention after a few marriages where the husbands ended up dead. The plot sprawls over hundreds of pages. I couldn't tell you all the details and how these things happened. It's safe to say that she has reached the pinnacle of her career as a woman of fortune. To enjoy the king's favour really was the height of her achievement. And Charles's mistresses were important political figures in their own right. In parallel to Amber's story, Windsor devotes much of the book to Lady Castlemaine, a long-standing mistress of the king, a literary choice that reflects historical research on this era. One serious history book chronicles Castlemaine's relationship with the king in a chapter hilariously called Porno Politics. Why was Barbara Villiers, or the Lady Castlemaine, so important? Uh, Barbara's fascinating. She, you know, she deserves a podcast all of herself, perhaps a series even. She's a very impressive woman. She's also vicious. She's politically manipulative. Now, there's always the danger that a mistress will get described as such, you know, just like we do in modern criminology with women. They tend to be either mad or bad, you know, because we can't deal with the idea of women being murderers uh, in their own sense. And so perhaps it's the same with the mistress for Barbara's that we vilify her a bit too much. But she's she's um, she's aspires to great wealth and power. And she does take an interest in politics. Um, we know, for instance, that she works closely with the Earl of Arlington. So they they can be certainly quite political and they do take an interest. I'm not suggesting that they're in and out of Parliament all the time, dealing with very minor specific figures, but they can be influential and courtiers know full well that if you can attach yourself to the king's primary mistress, that that can give you access to the king, you know, because you can get invited over to her house when they're playing cards and when they're drinking, there's a very good chance the king will be there. And that access gives courtiers or aspiring politicians the prospect of ingratiating themselves with the king and therefore the prospect of exerting political pressure on him. From the way I'm describing it, you might believe that the central narrative of the book is Amber's ambition to secure money or power by exploiting her youth, beauty and desirability. Unfortunately, it's much more prosaic than that. Everything Amber does, she does to secure marriage to Bruce Carlton. From the very beginning, after they had slept together in the woods, Carlton insists he will not marry Amber. He repeats this statement regularly. He's not subtle about it. He doesn't want her to delude herself. But delude herself she does with depressing regularity. He leaves London to earn his fortune privateering or colonising, coming and going out of Amber's bed at various points in the story. Every time he reappears, Amber convinces herself that he will stay and live with her. In pursuit of this ridiculous fairy tale, she acts recklessly and self-destructively. So many times in this book, I just wanted to take her aside and say, Honey, he's just not that into you. But Amber has fallen hard for her fuckboy, and nothing, not even the risk of poverty and disgrace, will dissuade her from making a fool of herself. And I can't help thinking this is the unfairest portrayal of Restoration Women in this book. There were beautiful women aplenty in London's theatres or Charles's court, but not all were able to monetize their sexual charisma successfully. Amber's character simply isn't richly drawn enough. I'd imagine anyone who can rise from the gutter to riches is not such an airhead. She is unapologetic about her physical desires and her mercenary habits, but these aren't particularly well fleshed out. I think this story underrepresents both the strength of character and the limited opportunities for women in Restoration England. 
I don't think we get to see how desperate some of them must have been. Amber is sent to debtor's prison early on in the book, but fear of poverty doesn't seem to drive her actions. Perhaps I'm being unfair to Windsor, but the absence of real tension or conflict in Amber's character seems ridiculous when the story is full of drama. The great fire, the plague, murdering husbands, incest, duels, deception, violence and crime. It's nearly a thousand pages long, so there's lots of space for colourful dramatic moments. But this is a fundamentally polite book that shies away from the harsher side of life in Restoration England. Obviously, a gritty story of a woman with no money and no social status in the 17th century would hardly be an escapist fantasy. But there was room for more historical fact in Windsor's book. In her research, she must have come across the rakish behaviour of Charles's courtiers because she very slyly alludes to some unspecified perversion of the second Duke of Buckingham. Buckingham hung out with those lads who defecated on the citizens, as Coleman Dennehy described earlier. He was notorious for his licentiousness. A contemporary said, There is no sex, nor age, nor condition of persons who are spared from it. In other words, he dried the crack of dawn. John Wilmot, the second Earl of Rochester, is the poster boy for restoration excess. Johnny Depp played him in a 2004 film called The Libertine. Like Buckingham, his sexual appetites were said to be boundless, or to put it in colloquial Irish terms, he'd buck with his socks on. Luckily for us, Wilmot wrote some truly filthy poetry. It's so extraordinarily rude that it was ignored by 19th century scholars and writers. I asked Coleman to read us some of Rochester's 1673 poem, Senior Dildo. It's not often you get to ask a colleague to read a dildo poem to you, so I couldn't resist it. You ladies, all of merry England, who have been to kiss the Duchess's hand, pray, did you lately observe in the show a noble Italian called Signor Dildo? This senior was one of Her Highness's train and helped conduct her over the main, but now she cries out, to the Duke I will go, I have no more need for Signor Dildo. At the sign of the cross in St. James's Street, when next you go thither to make yourself sweet, by buying of powder, gloves, essence or so, you may chance to the sight of Signor Dildo. You'll take him at first for no person of note, because he appears in a plain leather coat. But when you his virtuous abilities know, you'll fall down and worship Signor Dildo. My lady South-esk, heavens prosper for her it. First clothed him in satin, and then brought him to court. But his head in the circle he scarcely doth show, so modest a youth was Signor Dildo. The good lady Suffolk, thinking no harm, had got this poor stranger hid under her arm. Lady Betty by chance came the secret to know, and from her own mother stole Signor Dildo. The Countess of Falmouth, of whom people tell, her footmen wear shirts of a guinea and L, might save the expense if she knew but no, how lusty a swinger is Signor Dildo. I do find it slightly annoying that a historical period so profoundly lewd was written about so tamely by Windsor. But then she did write in an America where art was subject to serious censorship. Hollywood films were produced under the Hayes Code, where sex, drugs and violence could only be hinted at. And I think she had a particular purpose in mind for this book. She wanted to make lots of money. And she succeeded. The film rights were immediately sold and a film version of Forever Amber appeared in 1947. Her book sales were, as I said, incredible. It apparently sold three million in total. Windsor knew that a popular success couldn't be truly bawdy. If she had included more on Buckingham or Rochester, her book may not even have been published. She admitted that Forever Amber was censored by her publishers, so it must have been frustrating for her when Massachusetts and Irish censors felt it was still too rude. Windsor wrote a book that tried to titillate without outraging the censors, but she didn't succeed. The moral of the story is that it's impossible to keep filthy-minded censors happy. They will see immorality and indecency where there is none. So, how does Forever Amber fare in censorship bingo? The first square I marked off was masturbation, because Windsor says that Amber lies abed thinking of Lord Carlton one night. Okay, so that can be interpreted any which way, 
but let's take it in the spirit of the book, which is implied smut. Second square is abortion, and there's a fair amount of that. In this escapist fantasy, Amber shags with abandon, but only ends up delivering two babies, because her abortion techniques work every time. Since they consist of herbal decoctions and bumpy carriage rides, that's some feat. But I agree with Windsor here. People with wombs desperately want to imagine a world where unwanted pregnancies or STDs don't spoil the party. Obviously, censors don't like consequence-free sex, because wanton behaviour must be punished, but neither do they like abortion. On all counts, Forever Amber fell foul of the censors. Thirdly, there's extramarital pregnancy. Amber's first pregnancy is outside marriage, and most of her subsequent ones are by men other than her husband. There's sex work, because Amber accepts money for her favours. Infidelity, of course. There's general and universal disregard for fidelity in marriage. There's also some racism. The depiction of Amber's black page is pretty racist. Of course, there's lots of crime. During her sojourn with the famous highwayman Black Jack, Amber is a con artist and thief. I wonder what the unspecified perversion of the Duke of Buckingham was. I'm reluctant to decide what it is, since lots of sexual behaviour was considered perverted in 1944. It could be a reference to group sex, anal sex, bondage, bestiality, gay sex, or anything other than plain vanilla heterosexual intercourse. Windsor expects the reader to imagine a perversion, but leaves it up to us to choose one. I can't use this perversion for censorship bingo, unfortunately. Forever Amber gets a score of 7 out of 25 in censorship bingo. But a warning for smut seekers, it's all implied. Sometimes it's so coded that you'll miss it amongst the costume detail and the human drama. If you want uncensored restoration smut, the mother of all bonk busters is not the best place to start. If you want to fully grasp the debauchery of restoration court life, it would be a good idea to read a history book or Rochester's poetry. But I would say that, wouldn't I? Historians always think you should read the primary sources. In the next episode, I'll be reading Joseph Heller's well-known 20th century classic, Catch-22. It has lots of explicit sex, so I'm expecting a better score in censorship bingo. Till then, keep your minds dirty and your hands clean.